Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Finn Morgan. I'm a programmer, and I've been working for a little while on this game called uh, Sunshine. And one of the big challenges with that game was getting um, uh, getting animation to work on uneven surfaces. As you can see here, uh, this is a screenshot from the game. Um, I'll switch over to a, another screenshot from the game. Um, the way the game is laid out, it's a 2D platformer. Um, it's based on an irregular grid pattern. And as a result, it's difficult to assume that there's going to be a flat surfaces. So early on, we realized that this gave us a bit of a challenge, right? Because usually if you were to do traditional animation of a run cycle or something like that, you make some assumptions about what surface the character is running on and we can't really make any such assumptions. So um, I've got this, this little bit of concept art inset, very old concept art, but um, while the character is presently these two little white spheres in the middle of the screen, um, eventually they're gonna be this kind of satyr-like character. So they're bipedal, they're digitigrade, that means they walk on the balls of their feet like, um, like a dog's back leg, something like that. Um, and they're quite leggy. They, um, so their stride length is going to be fairly substantial. Um, and so we have a bunch of challenges. The irregular grid of the world means, as I say, there's no flat surfaces. Um, we can't make any assumptions about consistent step height or slope pitch. Um, we can, in theory, have slopes of any different grade. Um, there are some flat surfaces. You can see in the cave bottom left here, there's um, there's a player placed platform that is flat. And so we need to make sure that our run cycle doesn't look weird and irregular when the ground isn't. Um, we have some surfaces that are covered in this kind of mossy grass stuff that can maybe help us fudge some foot skate or some ground penetration, but that's not really any good to us because um, there are other parts of the ground that are bare. Like you see in the cave there, no moss has grown. Um, if there are problems there, it'll be apparent. Uh, enjoy this slide, by the way. It's all programmer art and debug lines from here on in. So um, as I say, we've got this world based on something called a Voronoi diagram. So it's not a hex grid. It's not a square grid. Um, all every grid square is, you know, four, five, six, seven sides, uh, grid square, obviously a misnomer there. And also the environment is player modifiable. So the, um, the player can, you know, dig out caves or place platforms and that kind of thing. So we don't have any design solutions to fall back on. We can't notice that there's a problem in a certain level and fix the level. Um, the player can come up with whatever animation breaking environments they want to make. And we've just got a deal. Um, excuse me. We also have um, a situation with bipedal characters in that they're sort of unstable. I'm not sure that's quite the right word, but they're um, they basically if a person is walking or running and you shoot them with a freeze ray, they will fall over. Um, there's very few points in a bipedal gate where you can pause their movement completely and they'll fall over, which means uh, when they won't fall over, which means that the stride has to be dynamic. There are a couple of um, procedural walks floating around the internet that people have built, which are really cool, that involve something like, you know, like a crab robot or a spider or something like that. They have the advantage that they can place enough legs to look stable and then move the other legs and repeat. Uh, we don't have that luxury. And also, this is a player character that we're trying to animate and players are unpredictable. We um, we can't hook into the AI and have that help us in any way. The player might just jump unexpectedly or turn around and we've got to figure out a way around that. So before I get too much further into it, I'm just going to name a couple of assumptions we're making. Um, first off, our game design philosophy, I suppose, is that Gameplay takes precedence over visual quality. Now, there's plenty of games that someone might make where this rightfully should not be the way they go. 
um, the first thing that comes to mind is um, famously the original Prince of Persia has a very much animation drives controls approach and there's plenty of games that do it that way around but that's not the game we're making um so what we need is for the controls for the player to be if not finalized at least uninterfered with by our attempts at making animation look good if we get the gameplay working really nicely and then the animation looks a bit naff sometimes well that's just something we're going to wear we're not going to um have any sort of shenanigans where we go in and change the way the game works to make our lives easier on the procedural animation. Um, we're also going to assume that inverse kinematics is a solved problem. Um, it very much wasn't when I started working on this because the characters have two kind of knees uh, per leg. Um, and so there was a little bit of hairy maths and weirdness. You can... Um, Try it yourself at home if you like by standing up, putting your heel on the ground and holding your hip in place and try and move your knee. You move it side to side because you're a 3D entity, but you won't really be able to move it forward or back. Whereas if you put the ball of your foot on the floor and hold your hip in place, you can move your knee and your heel quite a bit. Um, mathematically, that's because there's no one single solution to a two-jointed inverse kinematics limb. So there's a couple of things that came up during that, but for the talk today, I'm going to assume that one way or another, your engine supports IK, you only have one knee, whatever. Feel free to ask me about that. But uh, finally, Sunshine's rendering is in 3D, as you can see from those screenshots, but our leg solution is not. We're going to assume that our limb only bends in, um, in two dimensions. And last slide that is not what the talk's about is the player controller. Um, not the focus of the talk, but clearly something we kind of have to think about a little bit to give some context. So the way it currently sits is what I kind of call the hovercraft model. You could also sort of think of it as a unicycle with extremely good and bouncy suspension. Um, so Sunshine's player controller works based on a physics engine. Um, as in it's all forces, we're not directly setting position or velocity. Um, it's based on box 2D, if that's relevant to your interests. It's the same thing Unity 2D works in, so that might be um, something you've used before without necessarily knowing it. Um, so this GIF over on the right, we see our the rigid body is the upper circle. That circle is a rigid body with physics and momentum and all the rest. The lower circle is not a real thing, as it were. It's just a, it's a downward circle trace. When it hits something, if it hits something, then the player is considered on the ground. They're standing on whatever it hit. And then an upward force, the hovercraft force, pushes the body upward. The force is stronger the shorter the, um, the, shorter the uh, circle cast goes before it hits something. So you can see when the character goes over a bump in the road or lands from a jump, they sort of sit a bit lower on their suspension for a moment. Um, now, none of what I'm saying right now is particularly necessary for these techniques to work. The stuff I'm going to talk about now can work for different uh, player controllers. Um, it just gives a bit of context to what's actually going on. Um, it's also worth noting that this, this situation, we have a... Um, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, the controller is deterministic. It's not totally aphysical, um, and those two things do make our lives a bit easier. Uh, we don't have any instantaneous velocity changes, for instance. So if you're making a game that controls, like, say, Hollow Knight or Super Meat Boy, these techniques might be a little harder to get to look right, um, although I'm open to be proven wrong on that. So our first approach, I, I kind of wasn't sure about putting this gif in here because i'm sure people are looking at thinking like oh that's kind of adorable but um our first approach was kind of to just hack together some random mathematical functions and see how it went um and there you go that's how it went um i think you could maybe get away with this if your game was of a very sort of goofy cartoony style and also if you didn't if your characters were sort of rayman style without legs just feet um but it had a lot of 
bad situations and not too many good ones. And it looked dramatically worse when the um when the IK limbs were added in. So this is a very old GIF. I couldn't um I couldn't capture anything new because this attempt was destroyed long before I prepared this talk. Um so that was our sort of maybe we can just apply some noise and some maths functions and hope for the best and get away with it. Turns out we can't. Um, the next step, though, is a more simulationist approach. So what we want to know is how do people actually walk or run? What happens? What's the process? Um, we're going to simulate each foot separately. And that means we have two paths to our plan. When a foot starts stepping, that is a foot's on the ground, and for whatever reason, the AI controlling it decides that it's time to lift that foot off the ground and put it somewhere else, where does it go? And we also need to know when does that step happen? Why, what causes a step to start? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the first one because the first one depends on prediction. If you're running a certain way and you say, hey, you're about to take a step, your foot is going to land somewhere half a second from now, where do you want it to land? That answer depends on, well, where am I going to be in a second or in half a second? So that's where prediction comes in. Once again, we tried the easy way first. Once again, it was not really actually any good. Um, so for those who are not familiar with dead reckoning, it's basically the practice. So this GIF here, the green circle shows where our dead reckoning thinks we're going to be in some amount of frames. I forget what it was for this GIF. I think it's something like a third of a second. Um, so dead reckoning is what you do when you don't have anything better. It's just assuming that our velocity is going to stay constant and then projecting it forward. So it's essentially position plus velocity multiplied by how far into the future you're looking. And as you can see, it's not very good. Um, the thing we would hope for would be for that green circle to be fairly stable, and it really isn't. Um, the worst of it is that it routinely interpenetrates walls. Um, but so you see when they land, it goes through the floor. When they're running towards this little step here, it goes through the step. When they jump, it goes through the ceiling and so on. But almost as egregious is that whenever the character runs over a little bump in the road their velocity suddenly has a vertical component and the dead reckoning decides that they're basically going off a jump ramp and they're going to be airborne in a sec. Now, this led to some kind of hilarious outcomes in that our steps process went, oh, I've run off a cliff because in half a second I'm airborne. Therefore, I should start flailing my limbs wildly, which is kind of funny, but as it turns out, um, not what we wanted. So... At this point, we had two options. We could try and make dead reckoning less bad. Um, a few people might be thinking uh, dead reckoning can also include the assumption of constant gravity in a situation like that, which on the one hand, it could. But on the other hand, most of our problems come when we're on the ground and gravity is not, um, not of concern anyway. So I didn't bother to implement that. Um, the other thing we could conceivably have done is implement like a 10 frame moving average or something like that, base it on the acceleration, sorry, base it on the average velocity from the last 10 frames. Um, I kind of couldn't be bothered doing that and decided to uh, bite the bullet and do things properly. So um, this is far and away the most important point, the most important thing that I learned over this whole research project. So if anyone's kind of, half listening and in another tab or whatever. This is an excellent slide to tune back in on. Um, this is where we bit the bullet and said, let's just recreate the physics of the character's movement ourselves, outside the physics engine that is, and run it a bunch of times every frame. So um, one of my coworkers yesterday kindly pointed out that this kind of looks like a tongue snaking out to lick the environment around it. And um, so... Now I can't stop thinking of it that way. So as you can see in this GIF, a character has this sort of predictive green tongue that represents what the system thinks they're going to be doing over the next, I think it's 40 frames. But, you know, that depends. How many frames you go ahead depends on a bunch of stuff. Um, 
as you can see, it's a lot more stable than this. This is jumping all over the place. This system basically knows approximately what's coming. The contour is in the ground. It can tell that it's about to hit a wall and so won't predict that it's going to go through the wall, all that kind of thing. Um, and this was really the sort of the breakthrough moment when I got this working, um, a lot of things fell into place. So that being said, there are challenges associated with this. Um, it does involve, if we're doing 40 frames into the future, it does involve doing, at least in this case, 80 circle traces per second, uh, sorry, per frame. Um, one for the uh, foot trace going straight down and one to check if the body of the character is colliding with anything. Um, turns out in this if in this situation, that was fine, but it probably means that this isn't a technique you'd want to use on like a crowd of characters or something like that um, for performance reasons, I mean. And it also means you do have to get fairly intimate with the physics engine you're using. It's great if you have source code access to the physics engine or if it's well-documented because you have to get fairly precise in what you're recreating. Um, I didn't get this perfect. It's a little hard to see from this GIF, but especially here, you can see that I don't recreate Box2D's collision response perfectly at all. And there's some sneaky bit of, I think the integration step that's not quite bang on. So it's not perfect, but for now it is good enough. Um, but the wins of this good prediction system don't stop there because by doing this, prediction we don't just get future positions we get a whole bunch of other data that gets calculated over the course of the update step so just to reiterate what we're saying here is every frame we take our current situation we assume that the player's controls are going to stay the same and then we simulate 40 times just the player controller in the physical world and so that means if you're running at 60 frames per second you've got an array of future positions for the next two thirds of a second, but not just future positions. We also have a Boolean to tell us whether or not the character's standing on the ground at that point. And um, as represented in that GIF by the blue or redness of the tongue. So you can see when our character skips over that little gap, um, the line turns red. And then you can also see the sort of little cyan fuzzies on the ground represent the surface normal of the point where the um, circle trace contacts whatever it contacted. So um, that will form the basis of where we can put our feet in the future. Uh, oh, one thing I forgot to mention is that, of course, we can't perfectly predict where the player is going to go no matter what because they're a human, right? We can even if I absolutely 100% nail down every detail of how Box 2D works and get the maths absolutely bang on, um, that's not going to stop the player from turning around and ruining everything. So we do have to handle prediction misses one way or the other anyway. Um, and a side note here, this actually gets us a bunch of spare benefits because we have all this extra information. Um, I have These are things that have occurred to me but not been tried, but... It seems likely this is going to be useful for um, client-side prediction. We'll have unreasonably good prediction of where the player is going to go. It gives our enemies an uncanny ability to lead their shots at us if we so use so choose to use it that way, although that might end up feeling a little unfair. I'm not sure. Um, we can potentially use it for jump assist systems if um, we want that for like accessibility or difficulties, difficulty levels, rather, because we know whether the player is going to make a jump or not. Um so this is a pretty big win, although it does come with a cost in terms of both programmer time and CPU time. So once we've got that prediction stuff down, we want to talk about our footsteps schedule, right? Um, we've got two feet. There's no reason why you couldn't do it with more than two feet, but uh, you know, it's called bipaired gates on uneven 2D surfaces. So we've got two feet and each of them is going to be in one of two states. They're either stepping, that is, they're going towards being planted or they're planted. And we need a way of triggering a foot from transitioning from being planted to being stepping. And we need to plan out what that step is going to look like. So 
the logic on this turned out to be reasonably straightforward. Um, so have a look to continue with the earlier regrettable tongue analogy. Um, think of this as these sort of yellow circles being consumed by our creature as they run along. Each time one of those yellow circles disappears into the player, that means that's a, um, that's a step trigger. So the timing is about right. And as a side note, if those circles are staying still, that means our prediction is correct. It's hard to see on this GIF, but they're not quite staying still. They're moving ever so slightly towards the player, um, which is why I know that the prediction is not actually perfect. Um, so we have a little bit of logic. We have a, a variable called frames until step or time until step or whatever that gets decremented every frame. And that's what offsets our circle positions into the into our array of position predictions. Now, the frequency of steps is something you might want to tweak. Um, it depends on... we. I thought about making it so that it depended on the character's speed. You know, if they're running faster, then you take more frequent steps, I guess, or less, maybe. I'm not sure what I had in mind there, um, but I kind of just found that it wasn't necessary. I, I picked a number and went with it and it looked okay. Um, so there's there's potential to tweak that if it comes up, but it didn't come up for me. It's also worth noting that there is sort of emergent from what I've been saying, a hidden tweakable variable, which is the ratio of time that a foot spends planted versus airborne. Uh, I think traditionally for a walk, it's more than one. And for a, um, for a run, it's less than one. So for a run, there are points where both your feet are off the ground for a walk. That's not the case. Uh, again, this is something you can tweak around to see what you can come up with. So the process after we decide, okay, we're taking a step. The, the, the trigger has decided it's time to take a step. We've got a bunch of questions to ask. Our foot has a bunch of questions to ask. How long is the step going to take? And therefore, how far into the future is the step going to land? which is kind of the same question, you know, if the, if the foot's going to take half a second and we're starting the step now, then um, that means it's going to land half a second into the future. Where will the character be at that point in the future? And where is their stable space of support going to be at that point in the future? Um, and happily, this is the part where our, um, our prediction array starts to pay dividends. Uh, because we've got all that information basically good to go. We can say, um, oh, just just quickly, this image I've got here on these slides, what that's depicting is that the each position in the position array has a cyan line pointing to where its base of support is. And so to answer all these questions, we just have to say, okay, let's say we're running at 60 frames per second. We look ahead... Um, we have to take a step. We want it to land in half a second. Therefore, we want to look 30 frames ahead. We look up position 30 in the prediction array. And then we look where its base of support is. That's where our foot's going. Now, there's a hidden assumption here. And it's possible that this is going to cause any actual animators in the audience to laugh at me right now. But the hidden assumption that I've gone with here is that the foot when it lands, needs to be under the player. It needs to be on the ba stable base of support where the player is. And my first thought was that that sounded wrong. I need to add a little tweak variable in here so I can nudge that foot a few frames further into the future, right? So because what seemed natural to me in my head was when the player's walking, they... um. Uh, or when I, when I walk, I suppose, I reach my foot out in front of myself put it down and then my body moves forward. So I added that as a tweakable variable and then messed with it until it looked right. And then it turned out that the value I arrived at was approximately zero frames offset. So, and looking at footage, slow motion footage of people running on a treadmill and stuff, it appears that basically that's how it works. When your foot lands, it's pretty much under you. So yeah, I probably would have saved myself some time there if I actually came at this with some knowledge of traditional animation, but so it goes. Um, so we also have this problem 
that there are short little hops, right? Um, this isn't new. This isn't unique to Sunshine and it's not unique to irregular environments like this. In fact, I think this has been a thing at least as far back as Super Mario Brothers 1, where if you run at a one tile gap, Mario can just hop the gap without having to press the jump button. Um, but it presents an interesting problem for us, which is what do you do when you look forward into the future to ask, where am I going to put my foot? And the answer is nowhere you're airborne at that point. Um, so you can see here, the second little gap has a um, is going to have a footstep scheduled for it. So what do we do in that situation? And what I found works pretty well is that we just scan back and forward into the past or the future a little bit. Well, not into the past. It's just less into the future or more into the future until we find a place where there is a stable basis for our foot to go. And then we're good-ish. But we do need that to modify our timing. And I'll say what I mean by that, which is say we look 30 frames into the future because our foot is going to land in half a second. Half a second is a stupid number for this, by the way. It's just an example where the maths is straightforward. So we're looking 30 frames into the future for where our foot's going to go. And we find, uh-oh, that's a red bit of the tongue. There's no stable base of support at that point. Um, so what do we do? We scan back and forward. Maybe we say, oh, there is a stable base of support at frame 25 though. Um, so that's close enough. We'll aim our foot to land at frame 25 on that stable base of support rather than at frame 30 where there is no stable base of support. Um, another thing that I arrived at empirically that probably a real animator could have just told me is that um, that needs to modify the timing of that step. So if we bring it back five frames and we say, we're going to land at frame 25, we need to speed up the step so it actually lands in 25 frames into the future, not, um, so that's what, five twelfths of a second into the future rather than half a second into the future. And my instinct was that that should change the timing of all subsequent steps, but actually that looked worse. Um, so it just changes the timing of that one step and that will get you a quite pleasing kind of little two-footed jump when the character has to run across a small platform like the one in the GIF here. Um, you will want to have a maximum amount forward and backward that you can scan because you don't want to do anything too weird. At some point, the player will just run off a, a cliff. And if that happens, you need to... Um, they need to be able to know that they've run off a cliff rather than try to do some weird thing with their feet to make it look right. Um, so using that lookup technique, we're getting sort of kind of close to something that looks like it might work. So here we have the blue and green circles tracing out in front of the characters represent the left and right, it might be the right and left, I have no idea, feet and where they're planning to go. And you can see they tend to land in pretty compelling spots. Um, there's actually something, um, how am I doing for time? Maybe I'll come back to that if I have time, but there's actually a side benefit of the way the prediction works is that probabilistically the rate, the circle trace will tend to hit prominent spots on the ground, like the peaks of these tiles rather than the troughs. So you'll tend to get the character putting their feet in places where it looks like you would actually put your foot if you were running. They, you tend not to have the player just like step in a hole for no reason. Um, and so those footsteps looking okay. The next thing we have to think about is, okay, we have a foot that's planted. It's about to take a step. We know where it's going to go. We need to think about how it's going to get there. And so this seems like a great opportunity to take a brief uh, sidetrack into Bezier splines. I imagine most of the people uh, listening to me right now know what a Bezier, spline, a Bezier spline is, but if you don't, there's a gif of one that's very illustrative courtesy of Wikipedia. Um, it's the thing that you will think of potentially as a vector art tool, um, but something not everyone knows about these splines is that 
they're kind of fundamentally animating a point. So it doesn't just give you a line, it gives you a velocity as along that line. Um, this GIF actually gives you a pretty good idea of how the maths behind them works. Um, so why did we go with Bezier splines? This was actually mercifully one of the few things where I did the thing that seemed obvious and easy and it actually looked okay. Uh, we only need a simple shape. The shape of the foot doesn't need to be, the, the path that the foot goes for a step doesn't need to be anything too zany. Um, so four control points is probably enough. It can be reshaped very easily if you want to tweak it um, to get a different look. It's not like if you're using, say, an elliptical segment where it's a little bit less handy. Um, and it's very cheap to evaluate. And also we can analytically evaluate the velocity as well as the position at any point. And I'm, I'm going to come back to that, um, why we might want to do that. So this slide, weird as it looks, is important to me because it's the first time when I saw this and I thought, oh, we might actually get a solution to this because this this was the last big tech risk for the game. If I, if we can't get the main character to look reasonably okay, then that doesn't mean we can't make the game, but it means the player is going to be looking at something silly and not very good basically 100% of the time. So as soon as I saw this, I thought, Hey, there's hope. We might be able to get this to look okay. Um, and a quick, quick moment on how these, how the control points of these splines were chosen. I kind of really just made it up. Um, P1 and P4, as in, uh, sorry, P0 and P3, I should say. I should uh, talk like a programmer. Um, are the the relevant points from where the foot was to where it's going. But the other two points, we kind of have to make up. And I just kind of wrote a function that offset them a bit in a way that looked right. And it was fine. It's something I'm going to return to to tweak a bit more at some point in the future. But it was basically OK. One thing that's worth noting is that the height of the spline, as in how high the second and third points are, is offset um, more the longer the step that becomes important if the character slows down so they don't take these sort of big, ridiculously tall steps, like they're sort of wading through really deep water or something. Um, and now all that's left is interpolating our foot position along the spline. So <laughs> this slide, <laughs> this made me think, okay, maybe this isn't going to work. This looks kind of weird and silly. Um, but this was very easy to do, right? When you've got a spline, the maths to just say, all right, what point is on the spline from zero to one is pretty straightforward. So we end up with this kind of funny looking creature um, hurtling around in a haphazard way. The thing to try now is add our IK solution. So now we kind of have a character, right? Um, we've, they've still got this weird leading tongue thing, but it's starting to look like it might work. It's starting to look like an entity, mostly. Um, so I'm feeling pretty good about this at this point, but it does have some problems on slopes. Now, it works really well on flat, uneven ground, if you like. You can see for most of this GIF there, not there so much, but at the top of this hill, you know, it's still it's still important to manage to get it to look good on flat-ish ground because there's no actually flat ground here. But if it falls apart a little bit on the slopes, that's not so great. And it kind of does, right? When it's coming down the slope at the start here, its legs get very stretched out. And when it's going up this hill here, sometimes the feet basically reach over the hip, which is not so good and looks pretty weird. Um, so why would this be happening? Now, this might be particular to Sunshy. This is a point that might not be super relevant. It depends on how you implement your player controller. But the way I've done it, we've got our downward circle trace that works like suspension. And if you can visualize driving a monster truck really fast up a ramp, the suspension is going to ride a bit low, right? Because your momentum is sort of pushing you into the ground. 
that's what's happening here. And likewise, going over a crest, the suspension is going to do the opposite of that. And what that means here is our character's center of mass when they're going down a hill is higher off the floor than it would otherwise be. And when they're going up a hill, it's lower, which leaves us trying to animate a character that's sort of either walking where their feet don't quite reach the ground or running while crouched. And with apologies to animators that work on first-person shooters, running running while crouched is a hard thing to animate realistically because it's a hard thing to do in real life. Um, I'm just going to warn you, there's some, there's some programmer art coming up on the next slide, so brace yourself for that. So we have our hip displacement situation, right? Um, when our character's running up a hill, they're compressed. When they're running down a hill, they're stretched out. But right now, we're just pretending that the hip position is identical to the center of mass, and that wouldn't normally be the case, right? Um, when a character is sort of hunched over, their center of mass is closer to their hip. And when they're stretched up, their center of mass is going to look higher compared to their hip. And right now we're not reflecting that. So I did a sort of DARM implementation of this. This was just a 10, 10 frame moving average of the length as in the distance between the, um, circle trace and the ground that it hits, the longer it goes the more stretched out and the more hip displacement there is. So if the, um, uh, the, the, when I say a 10 frame moving average, I mean, remember the last five frames and then predict the next five, five frames, add them all together and divide by 10. Um, and that got us to here. So it doesn't completely look completely perfect, but we have much less of the issues with the slopes now because you can see the the um, light blue circle represents the same thing as before, but the pink circle represents the hip position, which can now move a little bit. Um, maybe it's still a bit of a weak spot, but this now is the um, is the gif that you might have seen on the um, on the schedule. This is now our state of the art, if you like, and so you can see when our character goes over that little platform floating in the sky, they do this sort of two-footed jump. Um, th and that's about half the time they'll do the little two-footed jump over that platform. The other half, they'll just put one foot on there and the other foot will do like a big long step over the gap. Both look pretty okay. Um, it just depends on what the foot schedule is doing as they approach the thing. But this is all, basically most of the GIFs I've shown you here are just pressing across on the keyboard and letting the character run. Um, that's certainly what this is. It's just pressing across. Um, so we don't have enough time for me to do a deep dive into every possible thing that can happen in a platformer. Um, but I think we can agree that things other than running sometimes happen in platforms, platformers, especially because we haven't even really talked about starting and stopping. So that brings us to this maybe a little confusing slide. I um, What we need to be able to do if the character's running and the player decides they need to turn around, what happens? What happens to a foot that's on its way to a position that the player's going to be and they're no longer going to be there? What we need to do is come up with a new spline for the foot to go off in a new direction. But how do we do that without it looking terrible? Um, one thing that I think traditional animators will, be, will back me up on is that it looks weird to have something spontaneously change velocity without it colliding with something. We can't just have our foot magically redirect and go off some other way. So I've actually, <laughs> in the slide notes here, I've just typed the equations for analyzing position and velocity along a Bezier spline. And it's, I'm not going to read it out. That's not very helpful. Um, but you can come up with an algebraically derived uh, way of analyzing the position on a Bezier spline and then derive it um, to get the velocity. On the left slide, we have the, um, I'll, I'll post it in Discord or something afterwards if people are curious. Uh, on the left slide, the left GIF here, the blue line represents the velocity, that is the speed and the direction along there. And on the right, 
we have a spline whose first two points are derived from that. So if you picture the first is a footstep getting interrupted, uh, as in the blue line is a footstep getting interrupted, and the red and white line is the new spline that redirects without um, uh, without violating the rule that the foot shouldn't spontaneously change velocity. Um, so where does that get us? That gets us to this. I've slowed this down in the hope that people can make sense of it, but it is admittedly a little hard to make sense of when our character suddenly turns around because the player decides that they're going to run in a different direction. We get this seemingly quite malformed step um, I think I took my hand off the controllers very briefly when I was recording this GIF, and so there's a little redirection right in the middle of it where that probably shouldn't be there. But um, essentially, we can detect this by saying, where does the foot think it's going and where is it actually going and comparing the distance between the two. And if the distance is significant, there's been a prediction miss. In theory, it'll pick this up if you miss the prediction because your maths isn't right or whatever, but it can also pick this up if the character changes what they're doing. It'll also pick it up if something like, you know, a rock falls on the player's head and they get knocked sideways or they take damage or whatever. Um, and so now we can animate the character stopping or turning around um, without it looking too terrible. Now, at the moment, I mentioned that I'm going to keep this in two dimensions and that's what's happening. So the two dimensions there are... Um, means that the legs can only spontaneously flip around rather than rotate. That's something I'm going to have to d deal with at some point when this makes the jump to visually being 3D. And um, the other thing is that happens in platformers sometimes is that the character jumps. So we have to figure out what to do with our feet when the player's airborne, not just from jumping, from like running off a cliff or whatever. And... Again, this is not based on anything particularly physical. This is just something I made up that looks okay. Is, excuse me, where the um, red line at the top represents the velocity, the direction of the character. We create a, a circle below them and project onto the circle surface forward and backward. So the green foot is our leading foot position and the blue foot is our um, trailing foot position. We pick a leading foot based on whichever one's in front when the airborne-ness happens. And again, just based on sort of guessing and looking at it and seeing what looked good, we then squash it vertically to get um, to make it into an ellipse. So if you can imagine as a character um, flies through the arc of their jump and their velocity changes, um, their feet will do a kind of jump-like motion, I suppose. And um, that is what that ends up looking like. So our character can jump spontaneously. You'll notice that that completely invalidates the, um, the position prediction because it didn't know that I was going to press the jump button. Um, and that ends up looking pretty okay. Now, I will say with apologies to anyone whose characters aren't satyrs, which I assume is most people making a game at any given point, that um, we do enjoy a bit of a freebie here because a recurrent challenge with animation of characters who jump is that they need to be able to jump on a dime. The player presses the jump button, they jump. Uh, that's not how it works in real life. You can't, you know, jump without any lead in whatsoever um, because humans tend to stand with their legs relatively straight. You need to go down, then up. Um, because our characters... Um, uh, satyrs, their legs are always a little bit bent. And so that's kind of a freebie for us. So I didn't spend much time trying to come up with a procedural solution to this if our characters uh, were plantigrade like humans. But on the plus side, this is not a problem that's at all unique to this talk, not unique to procedural run cycles and not unique to um, irregular terrain. It's completely something that got... Uh, that real animators have been dealing with in games since forever, and I'm sure they'll have much more useful advice than I can have. Um, so just some closing thoughts is that 
remember that you've got a lot of things to tweak here. If if anyone listening wants to go and implement something like this for their game, there are a whole bunch of things to tweak and that this isn't a physical simulation. This is not about being correct because games ask a lot of impossible things of their characters. Um, think about what it's like, what you look like when you're running along the ground and then what you look like when you're running up a 45 degree slope at the same speed. The answer is you don't know because people can't run up 45 degree slopes without slowing down. That's not a thing. The 45 degree sprint is not an event. Um, likewise, running flat out while crouching, um, especially if you have the ability to run forwards or backwards up a slope, it, it gets quite silly and there's just there's no good reference material for all these things that people can't actually do. Um, so realism is not necessarily an attainable goal here, and this is about getting it to look pretty good. Um, so that's it. That's me done. Um, hopefully things are working well enough that people can ask me questions. Uh, yep, yep. No, we still have a bit of time for questions. So um, I, I still, the, the watching the Satyr legs walk is hypnotizing. It's incredibly <laughs> satisfying. I, I just, I'm excited for the game to start so I can just sit there and make it run around. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, we have a couple of questions here today. Um, sure. One from Andrew. The first one is, how did you come up, uh, come to 10 frames ahead? Was there much back and forth or was just the number that felt right? Uh, the The number ended up being what I landed on because of, how long the character's steps would take. So if you're making a character that took lots of really quick steps, um, you could bring the prediction array in. If for some reason you were making, like if you were making a character that took lots of uh, fewer really long strides, then you'd need to look further ahead into the future. It's all about not falling off the end of the array when you look up where your foot's going to go. It, honestly, at the moment it's 40. At various points I had it as high as 90 just to see if I could get away with it as like a, a stress test thing and it probably 40 is too much um unless you also wanted to do some of that other stuff about having pl having enemy characters lead their shots mm -hmm. and stuff like that um excellent so we also have another question from an anonymous uh it's an anonymous question mm -hmm. um if you're going to make a multiplayer version or a local co-op version would you need to do this prediction on each client side and then animate it on the client or send this prediction between clients and only predict your own oh that's a good question i think it would probably be um i think it would probably be just local for the client and, and indeed we are hoping to have that be a thing in sunshine and so I'll potentially live to eat my words on this question, this answer. But um, I think whatever the, however good your prediction is on other player characters, that's what you're going to need. As in, as so if I'm a client and there's a dozen players and what I see is the player's server position, then I can happily get the player's um, server footstep data as well. But if I'm doing my own client side prediction for all the other players, then I've probably got to do, man, the word prediction is doing double duty here and it's confusing me. But um, Sunshine's the multiplayer, if we manage to get it in, is going to be co-op. So it's not as important that you know exactly where the other players are. Um, and so we'll probably use the servers stuff. But if you wanted to do prediction on the client side, you'd have to do it again, I think. Excellent. And um, we have one question that's just come in from Yuri. Um, how much are you planning expanding on the movement? Are you just sticking to running and jumping or are you uh, planning to add more movement mechanics? Um, there's definitely going to be at least swimming. Um, but as soon as you're doing something that's not directly in contact with unpredictable terrain, things get a lot easier. Like the um, being airborne was quite easy because suddenly... It's just like any other game. You're just airborne and it's fine. Um, if you were going to do, say, climbing, um, that would get interesting. One thing I desperately wanted to do before this talk so I could show it and I just ran out of time was um, different gates because it's quite, it's quite stylistically on brand for this game to have the characters skip instead of run. And there's that could be a thing that you'd easily do by just saying instead of going left, right, left, right, you go left, left, right, right. Um, so I'm still going to experiment with a few things like that. And also conceivably this could be a thing with like 
climbing as well, where you'd have to do something about um, about getting arms involved as well as legs and that kind of thing, which I think would end up resembling what you'd have to do to get a quadruped to work, which I've only sort of vaguely thought about. So are you looking at having quadruped en enemies? So, you know, that's going to be a uh, thing? Or? I'd like to, but um, any any students of mine that are listening know that a quadruped in a game is one of the things we always tell them not to do because it's way harder than you'd think. And so maybe I should follow my own advice and not do that. <laughs> we'll see. So, so no spiders or octopeds or any sort of, you know, up, well, up there? Up, when you get further on, it actually kind of gets easier because, like, spiders don't, you know, gallop or anything. They just kind of, like, you can get away with just saying, okay, I'm stationary and I'm on eight legs. I'm going to move one leg at a time and then move my center of mass a little bit. And it's actually not too bad. Um, there's a uh, good example of procedural walking on spiders in um, uh, Factorio in the latest release. There's a, a spider robot that you can run around with that does some of the stuff kind of similar to this. Cool. Well, we, we have uh, no more questions from the room. Um, if someone thinks of something afterwards, um, what's the best way to contact you? Would you be on Discord um, or Twitter? Probably Discord. I do, in theory, have a Twitter account, but I'm never there. So probably Discord's the way to go. Yeah. Discord. Excellent. Excellent. Um, it's been awesome. Do you have any sort of closing remarks, things you like, you know, gotchas or things that now you're, you're through this process, things that they should kind of think about before they go on? Um, the, the big one is the thing that I said at the time, which is just getting the prediction right was the key to the whole thing. Um, if you can pretty m get near enough isn't really good enough. If you can get the prediction to be good, then that's like most of the hard problem solved. After that, it's just tweaking around. But do give yourself a lot of time to tweak around because um, you'll end up with situations that look goofy half the time. <laughs> I mean, and that's the thing, you know, with games generally is that because it's not real, there's that kind of blurring between, okay, we're making it up so it needs to look right, but it may not actually yeah. be right. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a few procedural animation systems that are actually physically based, as in the characters move and their, their legs movement is what makes their body move, according to the physics engine. I remember a thing called Euphoria, I think, a while ago that was popular that did that, and... That's kind of the opposite approach to what we're talking about here. Um, but yeah, if, if you're getting the character's movement down first, then worrying about the animation, it's as you say, it's very much just mess around with it till it looks good. The simulation side of it is only good insofar as it serves that purpose and unreality that looks good is better than realism that looks dumb and broken. Yeah, I mean, and then it's often that whole smoke and mirrors thing. So sometimes in games, at least I find that you can kind of go, hey, it looks like this thing is happening. It totally isn't, but it totally looks like it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think um, the the hip displacement thing is going to be a bit of that where uh, we'll, we'll keep the character's collision model in a way that sort of at least reasonably matches where it looks like it is. But I think there might be a little bit of smoke and mirrors there to get it to not look weird on certain surfaces. Because at the end of the day, we're asking our character to smoothly run up a step that's almost their own hip height without breaking stride which isn't really something you can do <laughs> very easily um so yeah i don't know if these some quadrupedic goats do some pretty, pretty crazy <laughs> <Yeah>. things <laughs> cool excellent well I'll, I'll let you go and into discord and then people can kind of ask you more questions as they think of them um and yeah it was awesome to have you here today really awesome again i i'm excited okay. to to see how it comes together. And again, hypnotizing fawn legs is just all, I'm all about that. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Thank you. Thank you.